as they marched into battle at Antietam on September 17, 1862, which would become the bloodiest single day of combat in American history. The battle marked the end of Robert E. Lee's Maryland campaign. Following his victory at the Second Battle of Manassas, General Lee brought his army across the Potomac and into Maryland, invading the North. He wanted to move the conflict out of his beloved Virginia and to draw fresh troops from a Maryland that he expected would greet his men as liberators. Before diving deeper into the story, we'd like to talk to you about our video sponsor, Masterworks. Now these battles touched every aspect of life for Southerners. Even their culture began to suffer, with the once vibrant art scene in cities like Charleston and New Orleans practically vanishing. This may sound unimportant in terms of the war effort, but for many wealthy Southerners, this art trade was a great source of income, and stopping it was another way for the North to hamstring the Southern economy. And with our latest partner, Masterworks, that trend continues today, where the ultra-wealthy have sizable portions of their portfolios dedicated to art holdings. In fact, 85% of professional wealth managers now recommend art as an investment. Why? It doesn't behave like other investments do. The stock market lost $13 trillion in the first six months of 2022, its worst start in 50 years. But the art market had the opposite happen. It saw the highest auction totals in its 273-year history, defying the odds. That's why Masterworks is so excited to open this market to anyone, not just millionaires and billionaires. You see, Masterworks enables anyone, and we mean anyone, to invest in shares of art from the likes of Picasso, Warhol, and Banksy. That's because Masterworks breaks the art investment into shares, so you can invest in a small portion while you wait for it to sell again and their 500,000 plus members are already seeing the results. So far, Masterworks has sold six paintings for an average return of 29%. As a result, demand for Masterworks is so high that there's a wait list. But you can check out the link in the description to skip to the top of the heap. Now is as great a time as ever to look into new potential investments. We certainly have. Thanks for listening. Now back to our presentation. In an hour after the passage of the Potomac, the command continued the march through the rich fields of Maryland. The country people lined the roads, gazing in open-eyed wonder upon the long lines of infantry. And as far as the eye could reach was the glitter of the swaying points of the bayonets. It was the first ragged rebels they'd ever seen, and though they did not act either as friends or foes, still they gave liberally and every haversack was full that day at least. No houses were entered, no damage was done, and the farmers in the vicinity must have drawn a long breath as they saw how safe their property was in the very midst of the army. Private Alexander Hunter, Company A, 17th Virginia Infantry. Though Maryland remained with the Union, it was a slave state. Many in Maryland were sympathetic to the Southern cause. Lee believed that these were the men who would join his army if they were given the chance. Lee and Confederate President Jefferson Davis also hoped that a successful northern campaign would encourage the European powers to lend political and military support to the Confederacy, as well as influence the upcoming midterm elections in the Union, putting more peace Democrats in Congress. The recent Confederate success at the Second Battle of Bull Run, or Second Manassas, had some European leaders leaning toward recognizing the Confederacy as a legitimate government and treating with both the CSA and the USA as two separate nations. And in the Union, the public was frustrated with Lincoln's failure to end the war quickly. A successful invasion, Lee and Davis hoped, could indeed hasten the end of the war but not to the Union's benefit. Lee believed he would face minimal resistance as the Union Army of the Potomac was demoralized by its loss at Manassas and would take weeks to reorganize. Upon reaching Frederick, Maryland, Lee drew up a proclamation to the people of Maryland. It declared that his army had arrived to help them throw off the foreign yoke of oppression by the U.S. government. 
But the people of Maryland did not greet Lee with open arms. Many, if not most, secessionist-leaning Marylanders had long since gone south and had already joined the Confederate forces. Those who remained were appalled at the invasion. Furthermore, Lee's bedraggled, hungry, poorly clothed army did not inspire young men to join their cause. Lee then divided his forces, sending Stonewall Jackson with about half of the army to capture Harper's Ferry, seizing the weapons and ammunition stored there and securing his lines of supply further south. General Jackson and his 30,000 troops were able to overwhelm the 12,000 Union troops in place at Harper's Ferry. The rest of Lee's army moved northwest toward Hagerstown, Maryland, across South Mountain. But another of the Southern commander's assumptions proved incorrect. Rather than taking weeks to reorganize Union forces, General George McClellan accomplished it in days. General John Pope was relieved of his command following the disaster at Second Manassas. His Army of Virginia was folded into McClellan's Army of the Potomac. McClellan's superior organizational skills and the love his men had for their Little Mac reinvigorated the Northern forces as they marched into Maryland to head off the invasion. The Union Army moved into Frederick just days after Lee's army had departed. Upon learning of the proximity of the Union forces, Lee sent word to all his commanders to regroup outside of Sharpsburg, Maryland, near Antietam Creek. Unfortunately for Lee, McClellan received a copy of Lee's orders on September 13th. With these in hand, McClellan had an opportunity to take his larger force and destroy Lee's army in pieces. But McClellan was ever cautious, always overestimating the size of his enemy's forces. He moved slowly, cautiously, and by the time he committed his troops to battle on September 17th, most of Lee's troops had joined him near Sharpsburg. And now came the moment of battle that tried us severely. Not that there was a sign of hesitancy or a show of poor behavior, but it is terrible to march slowly into danger and see and feel that each second your chance for death is surer than it was the second before. The desire to break loose, to run, to fire, to do something, no matter what, rather than to walk is almost irresistible. We were under fire and advancing at a brisk walk, closed in mass, ten ranks deep. We were almost as good a target as a barn. Union Lieutenant John Meade Gould described his regiment's experience as they marched into battle at Antietam on September 17, 1862. The armies fought across open fields and cornfields, along roads and next to a bridge later named for Union General Burnside. Lieutenant Gould described his regiment's experience. The fire of the enemy became more galling every step we took, and one man after another fell. The battle had been terribly severe to us, engaged as we were at close quarters, and with troops that had seen so much more fighting than we had. The well-aimed bullets of the rebels as they went zipping past us, killing and wounding our comrades, and sometimes cutting spitefully through our clothes, made us the most nervous, of course. Every stalk of corn in the northern and greater part of the field was cut as closely as could have been done with a knife. And the slain lay in rows, precisely as they had stood in their ranks a few moments before. It was never my fortune to witness a more bloody, dismal battlefield. General Joseph Hooker, 1st Corps, Army of the Potomac. The battle at Antietam saw 23,000 casualties, killed, wounded, captured, or missing. A quarter of the Army of the Potomac, and over 30% of the Army of Northern Virginia. Over 6,000 American soldiers, North and South, lost their lives on that day of battle. As historian James M. McPherson notes, American casualties at Antietam were four times greater than American losses at Normandy on June 6, 
1944. Despite his losses on the 17th, General Lee and his army stood their ground when dawn broke on the 18th. They stood facing McClellan's larger army, which included 20,000 fresh reserves who had not fought the previous day, and they prepared themselves for attack. But that attack never came. Eventually, Lee withdrew his forces across the Potomac. From one perspective, neither side won that bloody battle. Despite being greatly outnumbered, Robert E. Lee's superior generalship had allowed his smaller army to inflict significant damage on the Union forces. At the same time, General McClellan's hesitancy and his decision to hold a third of his army in reserve prevented the Army of the Potomac from smashing Lee's army once and for all. Although McClellan was able to build a great army for Lincoln, he was not able to use it. Lieutenant Charles Brewster of the 10th Massachusetts was working at a recruiting station in Cambridge when he learned of the results at Antietam. He wrote in a letter home to his mother. I see the news begin to grow less favorable to our side in the late battles. At first they were going to bag the whole rebel army. Now they are driven back into Virginia, which is not the place to bag them by a long shot. But though McClellan might have been able to accomplish far more than he did at Antietam, it was nonetheless a strategic Union victory. Lee's army was stopped short. The Northern invasion had failed. The Army of Northern Virginia returned to Virginia. The loss at Antietam put a halt to chances of European recognition of the Confederacy. Karl Marx, living in London, had been following the American Civil War closely, writing numerous articles about it, in October 1862, stating what many had already agreed upon, he wrote. The short campaign in Maryland has decided the fate of the American Civil War. However much the fortune of war may still vacillate between the opposing parties for a shorter or longer time. In the elections in November, although the Peace Democrats would capture more seats than they had previously held, Lincoln's Republican Party would maintain control of the House of Representatives. Combined with the Unionists, who were also committed to preserving the Union through military means, they controlled the majority vote. The Maryland invasion had failed in all of its goals. But the suffering of Antietam was felt by both sides. Second Lieutenant B.F. Blakesley of the 16th Connecticut Volunteers wrote, In a room about 12 by 20 feet, a bloody table stood, and around it were five surgeons. A wounded man was laid on the table, and it, and it took but a few seconds for them to decide what to do, but a few minutes to do it. The amputated limbs were thrown out of a window. In 48 hours, there were as many as two carts of loaded, amputated legs, feet, arms, and hands in the pile. Plenty of men most of them slightly wounded, were hard at work carrying the wounded to and fro, making beds of straw, hauling and cutting wood, and assisting in a thousand ways. Antietam looms large in American memory, not simply because of the long casualty lists, but because it was the first major battle to be thoroughly documented by photography. Photographer Alexander Gardner, working for noted photographer Matthew Brady, brought the images of the true horrors of war home to Americans for the first time. Brady exhibited these photographs in his New York gallery. On October 20th, 1862, the New York Times described the effect these images had on civilians back home. Mr. Brady has done something to bring home to us the terrible reality and earnestness of war. If he has not brought bodies and laid them in our dooryards and along the streets, he has done something very like it. At the door of his gallery hangs a little placard, The Dead of Antietam. Crowds of people are constantly going up the stairs. You will see the hushed, reverend groups standing around these weird copies of Carnage, bending down to look in the pale faces of the dead. We should scarce choose to be in the gallery. When one of the women bending over them should recognize a husband, a son, or a brother in the still, lifeless lines of bodies that lie ready for the gaping trenches. 
Those lifeless lines of bodies weighed on President Lincoln. But what frustrated him most about the battle at Antietam was the series of missed opportunities. Yes, General McClellan had succeeded in stopping Robert E. Lee's invasion of Maryland, but General Lee had succeeded in preventing his own army's destruction at the hands of the Army of the Potomac. While Lincoln was glad to have the immediate threat removed, he saw the failure to smash Lee's army after Antietam as a lost opportunity to end the war. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to help us produce more compelling historical content like this, please like, comment below, and share this video with fellow history buffs. And of course, be sure to subscribe to help keep history happening.